This is what the heck is free CAD and why do I care? If that's what you're looking for, this is the right place. All right. So who the heck am I? Well, first of all, I'd like to introduce, I, my name's John, I'll be your tour guide today. Um, I started learning AutoCAD about um, years ago, <laughs> uh, way too many. Uh, I was a multimedia dev creator for a while at a startup, among other things. I used Cubicomp, Macromind 3D, Stratavision 3D, um, you know, Lightwave 3D, a lot of these. So, uh, by the way, if you recognize some of these programs up here, you might be old. <laughs> yeah, so that's who I am, and it's going to be pertinent. Uh, you'll see in a moment. So, what the heck is this? Well. It's a presentation of what? First of all, let's tell you what it's not, because that, that helps a lot. It's not a tutorial. It's not a scholarly analysis. It's not, hopefully, boring. So we're going to kick in and do a few things quickly, I hope. And so that brings us to what this is. It's going to be fast, hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully not too fast, but uh, I put up my slide deck, it's uploaded, it's got full speaker notes in case you miss something, they're recording this. Trying to get the information to you in a way so you can feel it. And if you want to get details later, you can go back. So it's going to be uh, fast, subjective, you know, um, it's not going to be that details, and it's going to be a challenge. But... You know, not to say that FreeCAD itself is challenging. Oh, did I lose it? Challenging. Yeah, not to say that FreeCAD itself is going to be challenging, but that instead it will be a, maybe a personal challenge for you to, in the fun sense of the word, in order to see what you might be able to do once you get a little hands-on with a new tool. Hopefully you'll come away with this, from this being a little inspired uh, to get going and get in there and see what you can do. So that kind of challenge, the good kind. <laughs> now, and then the answer. Well, the title of this presentation does ask a question. What is the answer? You might say, we'll get to it <laughs> later. <laughs> All right. So now that we had a little chance to get an idea of what's going to be happening, seems good to start an overview of the software itself. So one way to do that is to run through a few quick comparisons against some of the other common, commonly used packages in this area. So when you think of FreeCAD, you might hear some of these come up. How about F Fusion 360? Um, it used to be a huge player in this market and more hobbyists or you guys getting started, you're not a professional, you're looking to pick something up. Uh, I almost started, but it does take an annual subscription to use, technically. Technically, for full power use, you have to s buy it in that case. Um, now, it also uses cloud storage to keep its files. That could be an issue for some people. More importantly, a few years ago, uh, fall 2020, I think, they did a revamp of their licensing agreement for the free hobbyist version. So what you got is, I mean, the company is good, the product is good, the new terms, not too bad, but it's not looking f for us, maybe, in, in where it's oriented. So, you know, it's not a safe bet for non-commercial use, maybe. And then... Away from, the, um, away from the philosophical factor, back to the practical, it's only Mac and Windows. There's no Linux version, so some people might not like that. Uh, next one, OpenSCAD. And in the past, here at Scale, I've given a presentation on that if you're interested in looking up on it. But the main thing is OpenSCAD is for coding 3D objects for some purpose. FreeCAD is for drafting them. They're both parametric and share some conceptual overlap, but those are different tools for different purposes. Um, and, but if you want, FreeCAD does have an OpenSCAD integration, so they play nice. Um, and, but in addition to that one, they also have a bunch of other dedicated workbenches to make it more extensible and powerful. And we'll come back to a little more on workbench in a moment. 
And finally, here's the big one in my mind. This, this is where you need to be looking. Blender. Blender is really good. Um, nowadays, you can get industry 3D animation jobs. You want to go animate a movie for Netflix? Blender can get you that job if you're good at it and you know the right people, whatever. FreeCAD is more for drafting and designing 3D objects for CNC, production, other things, drawing, you know, drafting, all sorts of things, serious things like that. <laughs> but Blender is generally more of an artist tool, better for crafting 3D objects, mo modeling in mushing and, and just sculpting, say, kind of feel, whereas CAD, FreeCAD is for designing, drawing, and everything else. Um, then, there are a few more. Uh, Tinkercad is one of the big ones. Um, several others. Mesh Mixer is kind of fading out of favor now, um, lacking updates and other support. Uh, Tinkercad, like one of the problems, is a common problem with many of these, is it's web-based. Sure, you, you can use it free. Any browser, just fire up, start using it, but you're tied into whoever's providing that. It's not open source. You can't run your own. If the service goes away, boop. Where are you? Uh, you know, to me, that is a long-term concern. Long-term meaning more than a year. <laughs> and so I just think, you know, you're, you're, these are easier to get started for some of them, but you'll hit the limitations sooner or later. So it's better to get FreeCAD, I think, as one of your tools to use as you move forward. And notice I use the plural on tools. Don't just use one. The right tool for the right job. So speaking of FreeCAD again, and the right, being the right tool, we're going to go over quickly a few strengths and weaknesses. Uh, some of the general strengths. Uh, it checks a lot of the buzzword boxes. It's a general CAD package that's parametric. Uh, basically being parametric, which I've highlighted there, it means it stores parameters as it, it goes through its stages. It, it remembers what choices you made at each step, how many steps in an iteration, how far to make something. And you can go back and edit those later and modify things and cascade it and suddenly it will show, well, what if you start it differently? It, it goes in and automatically changes, unlike something where you're like using actual clay to model something. Once you cut off the arm, it's gone. <laughs> um, and it's... Let's see, whatever. Oh, heavy use of Python. If any, anyone in here use Python ever? Yeah, that's like half of you. Yeah, if you're a Python person and you want to get into it, the hooks are there. It's, it's powerful and capable. And then it covers a lot of the bases like um, uh, finite element analysis, BIM, architectural use, you know, a lot of the CAD things. And then some of the applications people put it to, more especially just picking it up casually, uh, includes CNC milling, laser cutting, and 3D printing. And that last point is kind of why I fell into it uh, and got, got me off the benches and actually started learning FreeCAD in earnest this past year. And it's because um, I got a 3D printer a while ago, partially inspired by Kyle Raskin's talk here a bit ago about 3D printing, and it's like, yeah, that is fun. I gotta keep doing that. Okay, and getting more and more into it. Um, and then some of the general strengths. It's open source. So it has good community support. It's affordable. You know, you can go for it. Uh, it's extensible, so you're not gonna be locked in. It handles CNC paths workbench. It has finite element analysis, which I mentioned, and that's often highlighted as one of its strengths. So for people who don't know that, it's generally where you say, oh, I have this shape. I'm going to, I'm going to make it somehow. When I put it into use, where is it going to stress and break? And you get all those nice colored heat maps of the high stress and the low stress. Um, FreeCAD can do that. And um, it does a really good job. Uh, well, fairly good job of SVG input files. Uh, I have a personal bias for liking that because of Inkscape and all, you know, but different story. Well, let's move on. Weaknesses. If, if you ask someone about a tool and they can't tell you the weaknesses, they may not be using it. <laughs> um, so, like many other capable software packages out there, it does have a learning curve. But it's, it's not too unreasonable. So it, you, you'll take a little to get into it, but a week or two going through YouTube videos and whatnot, you'll be up to speed, I think, probably. <laughs> uh, 
Um, some cite that it's not as powerful as AutoCAD in the size and complexity of models it can handle, but that's usually not a concern for casual users. On the other hand, there are many things you can do with FreeCAD that the number of choices can be overwhelming as first. So that can be a weakness, <laughs> too much. And then and it also includes the OpenSCAD workbench, so you can tie that together and that opens up all sorts of other things. But finally, it, FreeCAD just might not do what you want. Yet. <laughs> so it's under heavy active development, it's a very good thing. Um, you can get involved with the community, you can wait, and then you get new things to use and new toys to play with. Uh, get involved with the community and get your specific needs answered. Um, and one was like threaded holes was just added in the la last release, and which is a huge thing for me, because uh, for 3D printing and 3D modeling, threads can be a problem. But that's heading off into the weeds. Let's get back on track. Where do you get it? So here's, here's the thing. Uh, for Windows, you can download it. For Mac, you can download it. For Linux, it might be in your um, repository already, your distro. Probably too old. You don't want to use that old version. You want the new version. Uh, so you download it. You go to the website. Very simple, the huge uh, download now button. Ooh, boom. Pick your operating systems or operating systems, plural, that you need and go for it. And for Linux, you probably do want to get the app image because uh, it has the latest. However, if you're slightly more technical or slightly more impatient, you can get the source and build it yourself. So like Inkscape, the development teams work really hard to keep the latest tip of the dev branch workable, stable, and solid. So a lot of people are using the, the, their build of the latest so that they can have all the newest features. But it's not going to be one of the things where it's buggy, stuff will fall out, and it will crash like crazy on you. That They have a very good focus on that. Then finally, let's get into FreeCAD itself, the interface, when you go to launch it. You start. That's, all, that's the main question, I think, with FreeCAD. Um, so when you look at the interface, it follows the general conventions, panels, menus, toolbars, MDI window, all that. But first thing is this little toolbar right in the middle with just one single widget. That's the workbench selector. And it will let you change the interface to match your task at hand via, surprise, surprise, workbenches. So what the heck is a workbench? Uh, FreeCAD uses the concept of workbench like a shop, like a physical shop. Um, much like a workshop, might, you might have a workbench with all the tools for working with a lathe laid out with it. Uh, you might go over here and get on a different one for working with a drill press. Um, that's the concept they're, they're modeling, and it shows up in other CAD packages sometimes. Um, what you want to do is that be aware there's some overlap in the menu items and toolbars, so you might see this, uh, similar things over. And Getting used to switching the workbench is going to be a, a key to getting comfortable with it. And if you're looking at some tutorials or screenshots out there and the interface doesn't match what you're expecting, uh, first thing you do, check to see which workbench you have selected. You just might need to flip to a different one and boom, then everything will come into focus. Um, then I had mentioned FreeCAD has um, extensibility. You want to take advantage of this. Add-ons, so you can download add-ons, which are ex external modules. They could give you a simple macros, set of preferences, uh, or an entirely new workbench. And you can add your own, if you, especially if you code Python, go for it, make your own stuff. But just be aware that you, you need to check the quality, which ones you use, how common they are, and how refined, because a lot of people put theirs out there, not in the main download site, but all over. So you can get but be careful of the quality. When you first pull up the add-on manager, it might be a little bare, which is you see on the picture in the left. And then it will, after a few moments, populate, and you get a description uh, for the add-ons. I recommend, as you get going, two things you want to look at maybe were the A2 plus um, assembly animation kind of simple workbench and the exploded assembly. Oh, and the fasteners add-on is also very helpful if you do nuts and bolts and get into things like that. Then 
Over here on the left side of the interface is the combo view. You'll be looking at that a lot. The top part can switch between details for the current tree or the task at hand. Then down below is the data area. They can hold properties. You fine tune things once you create them. So sometimes if you go through the wizardish steps of creating something, it won't have all the options you expect, you, but they might be there on, as properties under the data pane down there on the left. Then at the very bottom window is the report view. Warnings and errors show up here. So you might, as you're going, one handy tip is to clear it periodically if you have them come up. Because then when you notice an issue, you can look and it will, it will warn you about something you probably just did rather than some mistake you made 10 minutes or a few hours ago. So just keep a little eye on that, keep it clear and you're good. Then navigation in the 3D realm. Uh, how many people here use some kind of 3D package already? Or have poked at some? Yeah, maybe like a quarter, a third of you. Yeah. So it does allow you to switch the navigation mode, like which, drag, tilt, turn, all those things, um, to match different packages. But it, it, it might make your transition into this a little easier. But then again, it might hide things. You might uh, not match tutorials. They say click, and no, you have to right click, or whatever. So. I'd recommend, at least at first, sticking with the default way of navigating, which is the CAD one. And in case you're like me and you accidentally switch it off and you're trying to figure out <laughs> what to get back to, it's named CAD. It will, in general, it's just remember, FreeCAD is a different tool, so treat it as such, and however that works for you, get it in there. Moving forward alpha into general navigation, it's in the top right corner there, you have this little cube that's floating that shows you front, top, bottom. Each face is labeled, and it lets you spin and, and change your view to match. So it's very handy. And then the drop down, the tiny cube in the bottom right of it is a drop down menu that lets you pick a couple of the most common views, including isometric, and also zoom to fit, which if you can't see your shapes, you know they're there, hit zoom to fit, boom, there. So that's handy there, and it doesn't have to stick there. You can grab it and drag it to wherever is convenient for you. And then down, speaking of dragging, and everything, by default, you have the coordinate axes down there in the bottom right. Um, X-axis is in red, Y-axis is in green, Z-axis is in blue, and yes, for the colorblind, they also have been le labeled by letter. So it's, it's very handy, small, unobtrusive, yet helpful. So remember, it's there. Also, if you get lost, you get, it can help you find which way is up, <laughs> literally. And it's also handy when using the clipping plane, which hopefully we'll, I'll be able to show during the demo, but you can look to see which axis is pointing towards or away from you and use that for clipping to zoom in and out and chop things off. That is very handy. And finally, the last part of the main UI interface, you can bring up a spreadsheet. It has an integrated spreadsheet. This is advanced stuff, but you want to use this at some point. So you can base your models and drawings on something a little more than just constant numbers you just typed in. Um, also, it can read your geometry, and you can see, you can have it read values. But here I have everything all in one spreadsheet. It might, might be good to separate those so that your input and output don't get mixed and you get cycles and programs don't like that. Um, then <clears throat> you can also, an advanced thing you can do is you can have add a property picker so that it will switch between different sets. So you can change a whole bunch of values with, through just one little pop-up change in the property viewer. But that's, you know, if you're interested, go look up details on that. It's a little advanced. So we're going to get started trying a live demo. <laughs> Yay. Um, you know how those go. But the old way was to start with the part workbench. It allows you to build up by adding or subtracting primitives, cones, spheres, rectangles, or cubes, and, you know, in different ways. It's similar in concept to what OpenSCAD does. And you, I don't think you should start with this one. It's, that's not the one you want. You want to go into the part design not part, but part design workbench. It's not old, it's new. It's got all the magic. Uh, the key thing is it starts by creating one or more instances of a body, 
and by design, FreeCAD wants a body to be a single solid. It can be all complexes you want, but one concrete solid. If you want to have two separate pieces, make two bodies. And then that's probably one of the tricky starting things there, but you know, once you know it, it's, it's trivial. Also, now if you look, even in my fairly clean install there, there's a whole lot of workbenches, so you can look into that, find out what fits your needs, and go from there. And now, hopefully it's magic time. <laughs> We're attempt to run a demo and go over some key basics. So let's run FreeCAD. Yay. Does it actually launch? Yay. OK, here we are. So here we see the, the start page. <clears throat> Has some recent things down below. It's got these examples, including the two in the middle with the pretty color gradients. Those are some of the finite and element analysis I mentioned. So go through these and see what, you know, what you want. You can also, since these are the default examples, there will be all sorts of info online on these. We're just going ahead and jump in, create something new, and see how it goes from there. Uh, now, here we notice I can start a part, but I mentioned the part workbench is an old school thing, and the part object is not what we want to start with. So we want to go switching to the part design workbench. Boom. And uh, this combo view between model and task, this tells me a tree, I have nothing yet. Um, and now, toolbars came out. By the way, these are standard ones, so you can resize them and move them around to fit your screen and your monitor. Also, you have a little pop-up for certain buttons, and then if a toolbar itself runs out of room, it, they give you this different pop-up so you can see everything that's missing. So get these how you want. Like, you can drag them into two rows, but I don't want that. You can drag it over to the side. Let, let me get this one over to the side just to have it out of the way. So here I am starting. How do I start? Oh, yeah, body. Boom, there, we got a body. There's nothing. What are we going to do? Well, oh, look, there's a sketch. That's what you need to start with. I create a sketch, and it's asking, oh, there's a dialogue. What do I do? What do I do? Oh, you have to attach a sketch to an object or a plane or something else so that it knows where it lives. The 2D sketch lives in 3D space. So let's go ahead and attach it to there so that, oh, it opens up in my view. Oh, and look, the workspace sw switcher has switched to sketch workspace, workbench, which several of them use this. So it's not just for the part design, but when you're making a sketch, this is what you get. You get, oh, look, a lot more toolbars. Um, also, it's jumped to the front view. Nice. So let me, uh, oh, here's a square. Let's draw this real quick. Boom, there, I'm done. Well, not quite. Uh, one of the things, you see the tool, the, the mouse cursor changed into the tool icon. I hit escape once, and it stopped that. Some of the tools, like the multi-line, you hit it once to stop the current set of lines, and then you hit it again to move on uh, out of the tool. You hit escape a third time, oh no, you've left sketch mode. Oops. Go back to your model, double click your sketch, you're back in there. There you go. Okay, good. Um, these are dynamic, you can move around, uh, and then you can add constraints, which is a key thing about a sketch. And CAD people might know about that. You want to give it some reason for being where it is. And one of the handy things I know is that if I click, then control click, then control click, I have three items selected, these two points and this line. <clears throat> and these here, which normally come up in default position above, I just move them to the side to make it a little easier to see. Um, are constraints, and I'm going to make that symmetrical. So that means when I move this one point, the other point mirrors it across this line. Perfect. Now I'm getting in control. Now I'm cooking. Okay, let's say about there. Yeah, I don't know. Close enough. And then I'm going to lock down the horizontal with a horizontal constraint, and it's got a constant. If I wanted to give it an expression, you have these little buttons. This round little button says F and X. 
you can't see it, I can't see it, but that's what it says. And in it, you have an expression editor. So you can say, oh, you can put in all sorts of things. Let's see two times three. And as you type it, as long as it can resolve it, it gives you the preview there so you don't even have to hit enter to take it. Oh, that's, that's too small. That's three times three times three? Okay, so I have an expression and it used that instead of my literal. Boom. Oh, that's too small, but you can go, so I, okay, I'm out of the tool now. Uh, select, whoop. out of the tool, go back in the sketch. Ah, now when I move over it, it highlights, so I can select it, double click on it, and I don't want that, so I have to clear a formula, then I can put in a value, and let's go back to 12, just, just to keep things simple. Also, here's the secret, you can look up in, on your own after this, the formula, you can also reference cells from the spreadsheet. So you can calculate your values in the spreadsheet using spreadsheet type things and have it used where you need it used. And if you notice now, it changed to a different color when it has a formula versus a uh, literal number. And let me, uh, I don't like 12. Let's see, 20? Okay, 20. Uh, a vertical, ver limit the vertical constraint, okay. Now one of the things is if I don't, so notice I'm still in the constraint tool, hit escape once and only once, there we go. Move back, grab it, I can slide it out of the way. So if you don't like where it auto placed the label, you can move it. You can, and then you can also move it down out of between the lines itself. So when you get a lot of constraints in the way, you can start moving things around. So then, say I pick this point, and I pick this point, and I give them a horizontal constraint, mm, 55, round it off there. Suddenly everything turns green. What is that? Oh because it's fully constrained. So there's no ambiguity. All these points live in a specific place, and you're good. If I undo, let's see if I can undo my last step, you see it tells you you have one degree of freedom. That means, oh, I can move this one way. Can't move it up and down, but I can move it that way. Um, and I can even select it. And if I look at my selections, it can tell me some of that. but what I'm looking for is one of these weird, look at these weird icons. Oh, this one says DOF, degree of freedom. Boom. And then I see, oh, these, these ones that can move are now highlighted, selected green. But I'll go ahead and um, lock it down again with a horizontal constraint. No, cancel. There to that point. Okay, now it's fully constrained again. Let's close that. So you have a 2D sketch, and if you, by default, hold down shift and right click, you can rotate. Now I don't know where I am. Oh, right. Uh, if I click on the skinny edge, it does a diagonal view front again. Boom. Okay. Let's, let's go to a default isometric view, like I mentioned. What can I do with this sketch? It's highlighted because it, green because it's selected, and then you can do additive operations in the yellow, subtractive operations in the blue, I'm going to do a revolution. Yay, we have a ring. Except I say, oh, you know what? That looks painful. If I wear that, that's going to hurt. So let me select that line. Oh, I can't do anything else. Everything's grayed out. Why? why? Oh, I have to OK or cancel that revolution. I say, OK, it looks good. Um, then I go on to it. Let me, uh, whoops, select only that circle in the middle. So that's green. Then come over to these additive additional ones, which the uh, fillet chamfer draft that is a boolean operation. Now I want to fillet this. Looks like it just chopped the corner flat, but wait a minute. If I come in here and I use it, have a mouse, wheel, I can type numbers, or I can use the mouse wheel to scroll them bigger and smaller. Oh, that's what it's doing. I could put a formula, whatever. So I say, okay. So now if I move this around a little, you can see, oh, that's a rounded corner. So that's how easy it is to do. I didn't even have to go put it in the sketch. Um, cool. Okay. Now what do I want to do next? Oh, this is a ring. This is, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, time. 
We'll do it quicker. Let's give it another body, because I don't want just a normal ring. I want to do another one. So let me do another sketch on that same plane. Oh, this is in the way I can't get at it. Oh, no. Oh, guess what? If you go to an item in the tree, you can move on to it. Spacebar to hide it. Spacebar to show it again. Um, I actually do want to see this while I'm working, so I go into this sketch. I can't click it or do anything because it's, it's just a separate thing. It's not inside this sketch. So, but what I can do then is go and grab a line, or no, let's get the multi-line. Boom, 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 boom. Now the square tool just does four individual lines. This is not doing a polyline. This is just doing four separate lines with constraints if needed. And if I look, this is a bit wonky. I can't draw, but I can draft. So I say, oh, make this vertical line. Oh, make this one a horizontal line. There, now it's pretty. Um, and then I'm boring, so I'm just going to lock this. I'm going to lock the vertical. This, oh, it's still, oh, wait a minute. Let me do the horizontal. Because I know the center, there, there's the center point. I could hide that shape if I wanted to, but I know it's there. I found it. I click that. I control click here. Say, okay, there, that's fixed. Why isn't it the constraints? Oh. Why isn't the constraints locked? Oh, yeah. I can still go up and down. There are several ways to do that. I will just make these two points symmetrical across this line. Boom, I'm done. OK. Close the sketch. Ah, I see it in relation. This is looking good. I jump over, say, oh, wait a minute. I want to make another revolution. Yay. I think. Well, OK. We're going to do more in a minute. But now we see we got that. Also, again, this is all parametric, so if I look at something and I say, oh, that's, that's a little too much, I can change that, 75 back down to 50, eh, 60, 60, okay, and close, and then my revolution is automatically updated because I changed the sketch. Then let's see what else we can do on there. Um, oh, pad and pocket. Extrude, subtract. But they CAD land, these are often called pad and pocket. There's uh, other things like that too. So, hmm, what do I want to do? Oh, I need to do another sketch. Okay, I'm going to attach it to this plane. And I'm going to do just a rectangle because I'm lazy. I want to do this quickly. I remember, oh yeah, I got to get that, that, and that. Make it symmetrical. Fix the horizontal. Fix height vertical. Still not locked down. Why? Oh, I can see. I can still slide it left and right, can't I? Let me check. Yeah, I don't want that, so I can pick these two points in this line and make it symmetrical. Which, by the way, some of the others, you have point on point, point onto object, so on a line or other, or curve or whatever, vertical, horizontal, parallel, perpendicular, equals, so two lines of the same size. So you only have to change the number once. You know, and constrain block, lock everything, horizontal, vertical, diagonal distance, so total distance of a line if you aren't doing horizontal and vertical only, arc or circle, and angle, and there's a little more you can get to, but we'll go, we'll go here, we're looking good. Um, let me go ahead and close the sketch. Let's stay around the center. I don't want to chop the center. So by the way, I mentioned the properties down here. Oh, look, placement. Hmm, maybe that's what I want. Position, yeah. Okay, what do I want to do with the position? Hmm, oh, let me look down in my bottom right corner. Oh, the x-axis looks like the direction I want to go. So let me come over here and play with the x-axis. Click in the number. What if I use the scroll, scroll wheel? Oh no, it's stuck. I can't change that. It's kind of grayed out too, so I should have known that, right? Oh, what about attachment? Maybe attachment. Oh, where it's hooked on? Yeah, that, that's probably drive. Yeah, I can change that. So, oh, look. 
Oh, wait a minute, no, it's a different X. It's the sketches X, oh. The, is the sketches Y? No, I don't want to change. Sketches Z? Ah, yes. So the coordinate system, the X, Y, and Z, might change depending on which object you're dealing with. So, let's say I bring that way out here. So it's just there, okay. Now, it's, it's kind of where I want. So if I look, use my little cube, I know the top is the top, so let me click on that, boom, I'm looking at it from the top. And yeah, my sketch does go right through there. So what I can do, let me switch back to your default isometric view, you know, handy. Oh wait, it's a little big, zoom to fit, there we go. Now you can see better. You know, so get, just play around, see what works for you as far as navigation. Then we can pad this. Boom. Oh, look at that. Change the number 10. Make it stick out. But I don't want to add to my shape. So let me cancel that. Let me select my second sketch again. Let me pocket it. <gasps> my shape disappeared. I did not want that. Oh, no. What do I do? Oh. It maybe it put it in the wrong direction. Try reversed. No, something failed. Direction, sketch normal. So I'm not sure what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, it, it cut through. Well, I know what's happening because I've done this several times. It cut through too far. So if I say, okay, it says, no, it, I can't do that. So let's undo that. So let me try to make this a little easier to do. So let me go into this sketch that, remember, I made smaller. Eh, let's make it bigger again. 80. Okay. Update everything. Let me clear this, as I mentioned before. Okay. Close it. There. Now let me take my other sketch with the attachment, slide it out farther again. Okay, so let's see if we can pocket this now. Oh, still getting it. Eh. First of all, let me make sure. Make sure this is big enough. And if, because if, I'm just doing random numbers here, if it doesn't work out, I can try something different. But um, let's see, close. Sketch and revolution. And by the way, I'm under, see how body one is Bold, that's the active body. I can hide the other one so I'm not distracted. Uh, look at this by angle. Okay, let's try, let's try again. Bucket. Reverse. This is giving me annoyance. So let's, for demo purposes, just go back to a pad now. Oh. Ah, uh, I think I... There we go. What was happening is I was cutting a thin slice, leaving a part there and part there. Can't have two parts, need only one. So I made my length of the pocket bigger, and that managed to c catch all of it. Okay, good. So that was it. Now I clear my errors because I know I'm good now, so I don't get distracted if I make a new error and miss it. There we go. So you see that shows you some of the problems you might hit. So if you hit them again, it, you, hopefully you'll be able to figure them out more quickly. That's why we're doing a live demo, not just some slides. All right, so then what can we do beyond that? So the, by the way, the latest thing here for this body, these are the steps that happened in the past, and then down below it got to where I made a pocket. Now I'm going to do something tricky. I'm going to do a polar pattern. I'm going to make the pocket, yeah. 
polar pattern occurrences. Oh, normal, I don't want the normal, I want the base z-axis. There, going up. And you see over here, what I did on this side now happened on the other side. What if I want to happen on, in more spots? Let's say seven spots. Boom. Oh, that's pretty. But look, they're not quite lining up. Eight. There we go. Now the corners are meeting. All right. Oh, I made a nut, a hex head, whatever. It's the start of something. So you can do that. Now you can do a linear pattern, a polar pattern, or a mirrored pattern, which is handy if you have, are chopping an angled corner off the top and you want to make it go off the bottom. You can mirror around the X, Y plane, and then you can do it that way correctly, um, which I did in an example I show, might show a little bit. Then you can do other tricks to that. And if you want to do more than one thing, <clears throat> like a pattern in one direction, then a linear pattern in the other, or a polar pattern, then a mirror, you don't add these up individually. Let me undo that. Let me just, well, let me delete that. Delete. Oh, backed up. Good. I'm where I want it to be. So I'm at this stage, and I'm going to try this multi transform. Ah, right click, and now I can add the polar pattern, and I remember I needed to do at least eight, and I can, then I can say add these others, and I say, okay. Oh, wait, I did my polar pattern wrong. I need it on the z-axis, so, you know, you make a mistake, you can go back and fix it. Really, really easy. So that's for making mistakes. Go ahead, go for it. You can undo it. Um, and then you can do other things. Oh, let me show that first body again. Yay. And then we do, yes, good, we have a minute. So we do the all the magic, and then all of a sudden, we end up with this. Yay. <laughs> Isn't that great? But no, this is um, carefully done over a lot of time. And a lot of experiments, so it actually prints well. Now, I, I, I want to see what's going on in here. And I mentioned one thing under view. I can do clipping plane. Chomp. And I see the letter Z. I see the letter X. So maybe Y is the direction I want to clip on. Yes. And if I clip the wrong way, I can hit the flip button. But no, I want to look at it this way. And then I can... Shift and right click to turn the angle. I come over here in mouse wheel to zoom in and out. And then I can see, oh good, yes. See this zigzaggy? This makes very friendly for a 3D print to spin. 45 degree angle, easy to print. Angle on angle, much less friction than um, flat to flat because it's going to have concentric circles. That's a nice little trick I picked up at some point. Um, so this is what you do. And then if you're done clipping, you can close it or you can turn it off and then close it and get back to everything. As you see here, I named my, I gave, you can also rename your elements. So this one I renamed from body to inner. This one I renamed from body O2 to outer. There, now I know what I'm doing. I can see what I'm doing. And then I select elsewhere and then I gave it some materials, a little transparency on this outer one so I could see through as I'm working on it. And then I printed this and it actually works. <laughs> um, I, I don't like the ring though as like a giveaway. I mentioned I might give away something because if, if a ring is not your size, it's, it's, it's annoying if nothing else. Now, by the way, I mentioned um, properties, let me see. Um, you can have all sorts of things in here. But in my spreadsheet, I had set up all these different ring sizes here with different lengths. Over here, I calculate things based on them, and then when I edit the spreadsheet, if I give it an alias, then I can reference it from my formulas. Boom. I mean, that's so simple, but once you start to use it, it's like, oh, wow, I can do a lot with that. And then let me close the spreadsheet, go back, and then bring up one other example I already did. 
this coin. This is a little maker coin. People who do 3D printers would often give, make little round coin things to give away to each other and to use up end of your filament. You've got like a tiny bit left. You can't make anything real with it. Might as well just make a coin. Um, and I redid this one. I originally did this in OpenSCAD. I've redone it in FreeCAD. Then I used the A2 plus assembly to put the pieces together. Then I used the exploded assembly so we can make it go boom. And then you can put it back. But, um, and then if I shift, you can see how this is constructed, how it fits together. And it's pretty simple because I did, again, like with the ring, I did these polar pattern of pockets, you know, did one shape and then I did a polar pattern and boom. For the ring, I did one of these angled cuts up top and did a mirror transformation to get the bottom cut. And since I was using a multi-transform, then I used a polar pattern to spin it all around. And so if I go into spreadsheet and try to break this, um, I have all these handy labeled things. And I go in and say, what am I going to change today? Let's see, num of cuts. Instead of 12, let's go 24. Enter. Let me look at my ring again. In a minute, it's thinking about it. I gave it a big headache. Do you know how many facets it had to do? A lot, but here they are. So now I've got a much more refined pattern and now I realize, oh, if I wanted to add that many, I might need to do something up here, but that's for a different day. Edit, I can put the things back and then we'll say, oh, that, that's useful. And then the ring size, if I change the ring size, both of these will change to match. And then I can change the thickness, all those things. Since they were parameters in my spreadsheet, the values are being drawn from someplace that isn't weird. The one got you is going to be if you attach a sketch to one of these faces, and then you change the number of faces, suddenly your sketch is completely somewhere else. And that should finish our demo portion. Let's see if I can switch back, keep changes, all right. And then, um, not confuse the slideshow. Let's bring that, okay, I'm extended, and then let's bring back up my presentation. Go down to post demo. And start over. Can you see this? Yes, okay. So again, quick little, quick little reminders for you to look up. Uh, the construction lines, oh, this is something we want to look at. We didn't cover in the demo because I wanted to try to fit into time. But this little button here, will toggle, instead of drawing white lines, you'll draw blue lines. And when you close the sketch, they're hidden. They're just helper lines so that you can do complex things. And you can change an existing line to and from a helper line as needed. So that's, if you click that little toggle, it will change all those other little shape icons from white to blue. And so those are really, really handy. Also, there's a thing about external geometry. But again, that will hit the problem I mentioned but I haven't named yet. Um, then you can bring that in. But datum, datum items. You can create independent points, lines, planes that are just defined, not part of a sketch, not part of an object per se, or they don't have to be. And then you can put your planes and sketches attached to those so that if your geometry changes, your sketches stay in the same place and you avoid that problem. So datum items. This is 
advanced feature, but you probably will want to use those pretty soon. And if I have these three datum points, I selected them and created a datum plane. Boom, see that corner there? I can attach my sketch and cut a corner, an ang weird angle, and it will stay at that weird angle no matter how many facets I change the number in my spreadsheet to be. And then, let's see, I mentioned a little about how to set the constraints. Uh, the function, little round button that you, it's hard to see here, but when you're using it, you can see and click on so you can use expressions instead of constants. And that cover, would cover the rest of the demo points. I just wanted to make sure that I had those covered. Then the problem I mentioned is TNP, the naming problem. That's where if you attach something to like the third vertex of the fifth line three vertex two of a s object, but then that object's ge geometry change, attaching to line two vertex or line three vertex two is going to be s completely somewhere else. It's not unique to um, FreeCAD. A lot of the higher-end commercial products have some heuristics that try to work around it. Often it works, sometimes they don't. But the big thing is that it's, you can work around it using datum points and things like that, but it is also the focus of the next release. Now, as I said, forward-looking statements, it may or may not make in, they might bring something else, but cur the current plan by the FreeCAD team is to fix th that majorly for the next release. So let's bring this back now to the answer. Answer the question I proposed at the talk. What, what, what the heck is FreeCAD and why should you care? That one's simple. It's fun. <laughs> it's powerful. You can afford to try it out. You can get started. It's the cost in attention and learning to get started isn't too high. So you can afford it. It's, it's, it's nice. Watch a few tutorials and you get going. And then why should you care? I think this is important. I believe chances are that it can solve one or more problems that you're having today. You pick it up. Pretty quickly, you'll figure out, oh, wait a minute, I need this, or I need that, or I could do this. And it's like, oh, there you go. And then we're going to do some quick questions. First, I'm going to point out the slides have references, including two really good YouTubers who have really good introductory, detailed tutorials. Um, that's Joko Engineering and Mango Jelly Solutions. So just want to make sure you go back to those. Um, and then... We'll have if any questions, although first, was there anyone who really wanted one of those coins? Let's see, can I throw them? Ah, no, they're not, they're not aerodynamically sound. <laughs> you go ahead. You can, um, I have a few handfuls for, you can come up and grab one real quick. And anyone though with a question, raise a hand. Any Question way there in the back. The file format that you're saving the uh, drawings in is a DXF format? Uh, no, although they do some DXF import export, just like SVG and other things. It's its own format, which is basically a zip file of a bunch of contents. So you can, if you're interested, you can look into that. Also, there's some. The import and export to, I'm trying to remember, some of the standard uh, CAD formats. Um, step maybe might be one of them. So there's a whole lot. You check the documentation, check online, and um, worst case, you might ask someone and someone might write an extension to add, add on to add a new format support. The, the for file formats formatted is important because for further processing, like if you're going to be generating a, a CAM file for some sort of uh, machine tool that you're going to manufacture the part with, it's important for the uh, file format to be something that it recognizes. Do, yeah. do you have any CAM packages that will work with the uh, FreeCAD? Um, I'm not familiar with the, the CNC work path now, but there is actually a path workbench or something like that that is used for people doing exactly that. So they're, um, they've addressed it. It's used heavily for um, routing or cutting and paths, editing the paths and setting that up. So um, check online, look at it. There's a specific workbench to make that easy. Thank you.
Hi, just a quick question. I understand that the 3D printer, they use the, uh, uh, the STL file format. Yes. How, how difficult it is to import that into the FreeCAD? Oh, good question. First one question, how difficult is it to import STL? First question would be, can, can FreeCAD export STL? Yes, that's the first thing. It, it exports, goes straight to your slicer, really easy. Um, FreeCAD can import STL really easily. Um, the one got you a couple years ago when I first was playing with it a little is I had a complex uh, STL I imported then I tried to do the finite element analysis on and it had problems. If I recreated that in FreeCAD, then FreeCAD had no problem analyzing it. So it depends what you want to do with it, but you can, you can bring it in or you can also import it and then use the external geometry thing to create a sketch to recreate it exactly by tracing the existing corners and lines. Yeah, I'm thinking more like, you know, modifying. You know, if somebody oh. created an STL file and you import it into, into yeah. the uh, FreeCAD and then can you modify it? Yes, if you import an STL, you can modify it. And for some people, using Blender to do, tweak it might be easier. For some people, using FreeCAD might be easier. But yeah, it can modify once it imports the STL. Great, thank you. Can FreeCAD do uh, 2D CAD for doing things like uh, laying out floor plans? And oh, can it do 2D? Yes, and there's a drafting workbench for doing plan layouts and all sorts of things like that. So yeah, it, I've seen a lot of architectural and other room designs done with it. Okay. Any other last questions? No? Well, hopefully they're percolating in your brain and you can go home and download and play with it and see what to do. I'll wind up, let you go, and you can see me after, and then I'll put out, I have a handful of these left if you want to come grab one. Thank you very much.